Um, so this is what I was thinking. I would uh, briefly read a, a, a short passage from it, and then we'll have a dialogue, you know, about different aspects of this book or of writing, uh, or writing about. What, what I love about Danielle's work, and I, I, I might, I hope I'm not being arrogant to think that we share this, Danielle writes about America, but the whole continent, without borders, without boundaries. And, and I, I, I feel a kinship with your work, and I feel like I'm trying to do the same thing. So anyway, uh, uh, once in a while, uh, I am asked to speak to uh, young or youngish people who are in creative writing programs, uh, uh, getting their masters. And one thing that I, I I really get the sense that their teachers are not telling them is that if they want to continue the bad habit of writing, they have to have another job. <laughs> uh, I have been lucky for the past nine years, and, and in Mexico where I live, whenever we say we're lucky, we look for wood to touch, and if we don't find it, we go like that. Um, supposedly that will continue our, our run of good luck. I have been working as what is called a mitigation specialist. I work with lawyers in the United States who defend undocumented Mexicans who are in jail, charged with capital murder here, and as such are facing the death penalty. I go to the jail and I interview them, and then I fan out and interview their families, friends, colleagues, classmates, teachers, doctors, anybody who can give me a piece of that life story. And um, that life story is usually a very sad and miserable tale with violence, abuse, neglect, starvation, often mental illness. And that can be the difference. It's an important tool for a, uh, a defense lawyer. And sometimes it can be the difference between life and death for the client. I'm going to read a little passage from this book that gives you an idea of what a day in the life of a mitigation specialist is like. Um, there's a couple of seats down here and one there, if anybody wants them. That's uh, you can move it. OK. Um, so just to set this up, uh, the, 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 there's a character in the book named Richard who is a mitigation specialist. He's not me. Uh, uh, but, but, uh, uh, there goes my first question. OK. Um, and he's, in this scene, he's in a little town in a dangerous part of Mexico trying to find out about his client, who is a woman named Esperanza, who is in a county jail well, a parish jail, because in Louisiana they're called parishes, not counties. She's in a parish jail in Louisiana accused of murdering her 11-month-old baby. And um, the very first thing that I describe in this passage really happened to me. So he's gone through this whole town trying to find the house of one particular person. Four dogs lay in the middle of the road in shades of matted gray and beige. Mama was mangy and bloated with milk and had about 19 nipples. Her boys were lean. I could see their ribs, the flesh rising and setting with their breath. As I got closer, they started to growl. What could they possibly have been protecting? Was anyone actually hiding a stash of something inside one of these broken down shacks? The wrong question to ask in a Mexican podunk. They snarled more loudly as I approached. The smallest one, a disheveled silver mutt, got up and yapped at the top of his high-pitched lungs. Why is it that the tiniest dogs always sound as if they'd swallowed a microphone? He scampered to my side. It's OK, I said, in a velvety but stern purr. I was perennially hopeful an utterance like that would shut up a barking dog, but it never did. 
He only bleated more loudly. Let him yap. I ignored him and walked on. Dogs liked me. Or so I thought until the son of a bitch set his teeth around my ankle and broke skin. I kicked him away. It hurt, but the shock was worse. I bent over and pulled down my sock. I was bleeding, not heavily, a steady ladylike trickle. The defense team would get a kick out of this. If they, had any pr if they needed any proof of my dedication, there it was written in red. Not only was I willing to crawl through dust and mud, I would suffer dog bites to try and save Esperanza Morales' life. I scowled at the mutt through narrowed eyes. He just kept yapping. I pulled back my leg as if I was going to kick him, but he didn't even flinch. I realized I had an audience outside the last house on the right, another ancient 60-year-old her thick legs rooted in the ground like old oaks. Her flesh was a wobbly mass under a striped serape she wore despite the midday heat. Two other women, their middles swollen after multiple pregnancies in jeans and t-shirts. One sat sifting through a bowl of dried beans, picking out the little stones. The other folded raggedy clothes she picked from a wash line. A tiny girl stared. The three adults did not acknowledge the gringo in their midst, inspecting his dog bite. I hoped that my victimhood would at least make them sympathetic to my cause. I limped in a straight line to the old one. If she wasn't Juventino's mom, I was Pancho Villa. Buenas tardes, I said. Senora Escobar, my name is Richard. She just stared at me. Who the hell was I? How did I know her name? Juventino's mother? I asked. She wouldn't say yes and she wouldn't say no. Not until I showed my cards. She just kept looking at me, her arms folded across her chest. Is Juventino ar around? We have friends in common in Los States. I have regards from Espor Esperanza Morales. Let me see if she's here, she said. If he's here, she said, and walked inside. He emerged from the adobe. Short, lean, muscular, a battered Dallas Cowboys hat, a thick black mustache like a hero of the Mexican Revolution, a three-day growth of beard, watery black eyes, a gray t-shirt with multiple holes. Who knows what color it had been when new? An, an emblem of the Virgin of Guadalupe around his neck, he nodded. I told him to call me Richard and shook his hand. I'm here on behalf of Esperanza Morales. I said, could we please talk for a few minutes? Sure, he said. We were standing on the dirt path to his house. Thanks, I said. Where can we talk? Here. I looked down at my ankle. The blood was saturating the dirt and mud on my sneaker. Could we sit down somewhere, I said, adding, I got bit by one of those dogs down the street. I'm bleeding. Juventino looked around. You can sit there, he said, indicating a pile of rocks with his chin. I could have stayed in Ojeras for 10 years, and he never would have invited me inside. I squatted on the rocks and removed a stenographer's notebook from my backpack, a pen from my pocket. Juventino stood over me like Zeus. You know that Esperanza's in jail, right? He paused before answering, as if it had been a trick question. I think I heard something about that. She's in jail in, for murder in Louisiana, in El Gabacho, I said. The prosecutor wants to give her the death penalty, Juventino. Oof, he said, pointing his chin and making an ambiguous moo. He might have felt sorry for her, or he may have been impressed with her achievement. I let the idea of the death penalty sink in for a minute before saying, I work for her lawyer. I'm an investigator. My job is to put together the story of her life to show the prosecutor that she's a human being who deserves mercy, who doesn't deserve to die. I spoke slowly and quietly as possible. Juventino's mother and sisters were only two or three yards away, pretending not to listen. You are married to Marta, right? Marta is one of Esperanza's sisters. 
you were married to Marta, right? Yes. When was that? He scrunched up his features as if I'd asked him to solve a multivariable calculus problem. He didn't answer. When did you and Marta split up? A long time ago. Okay, but like how long? No response. A year ago? Five years ago? More? He nodded, yes. For Mexican villagers, chronology was at best vague. Sometimes you had to let issues of time roll out with the tide. I hoped that Marta would be more specific when I caught up with her in Morelia. Tell me about her family, I said. They were buena gente, he said, good people. They were always good people. Most people who are facing death row come from families in whose bosoms there is systematic abuse, neglect, violence, and poverty to the point of malnutrition. If you hit the jackpot, you'll get learning disabilities, brain damage, or mental illness as well. That's good luck because according to the Supreme Court, you're not supposed to execute someone who's mentally ill. But to hear the witnesses tell it, they were all good people. Good in what way? I asked. Good people, he looked at me quizzically. Good how? Good like hardworking? Good like generous? Like giving away their food and their money to people who needed it more than they did? Good like petting dogs and cats? A list of questions like that is what is known as leading the witness. You're not supposed to do it. You are supposed to stand there through silences so long that you could drive a convoy of trucks through them. You are supposed to wait for them to answer until your hair turns gray and your teeth fall out and an archaeologist discovers your fossil in the desert after the next ice age. In the real world, at least with someone like Juventino, at times you have to give them a menu of answers to choose from. They worked very hard, he said. Don Fernando, that was Esperanza's father, he helped me to find work, reading between the lines. Don Fernando might have beat his wife and children with a skillet every Friday night after dinner. He might have stolen from his neighbors, raped his own grandchildren, and on some Aztec nostalgia trip, cut the hearts out of his contemporaries and eaten them while they still beat four to the bar. But he helped Juventino find work spreading cement or picking beans. So he was good people. And what about Esperanza? What was she like? Tranquila, he said. How I grew to hate that word. Tranquila, easygoing, calm, peaceful, quiet. Every single Mexican in jail in the United States is, above all, tranquilo. at least according to their relatives and friends, colleagues and classmates, teachers and doctors. Tranquila in what way, Juventino, I asked. Now he looked at me as if I were a moron. How many ways were there to be tranquilo? Tranquila as she was quiet and she didn't say very much? Tranquila like she was easygoing and helped other people? Tranquila like if there was a difficult situation, she would try to solve the problem? Juventino stopped to consider the choices on the menu and then something happened to his face. He, his brow relaxed and the pupils of his eyes acquired a sheen of glaze like that which envelops a Krispy Kreme donut. <laughs> he gave up. This was too complex for him. I tried to reel him back. Remember, Juventino, I said, the state of Louisiana wants to kill Esperanza. I'm trying to help save her life. I rolled down my sock to get another glimpse of the wound. The teeth marks and the blood and the dirt were starting to look like the preliminary sketch of an ab abstract painting. I would need to buy a bottle of iodine on the way to Puro Aire, maybe even see a doctor. They would be reimbursable expenses. She didn't say much, he said. Then he held up his hands, tilted his head to one side, at least not to me. But she was good people. For the next 20 minutes, I tried every which way to get something, anything, out of the poor guy. I asked each question five times with slight variations. Offered him every option I could think of. 
If his answers weighed in at three syllables, it was a miracle. Finally, I couldn't think of anything else to say. I just look, looked at him impassively, hoping the mirror of my face might inspire some memory. He could tell I was unsatisfied. He only shrugged. ¿Qué quieres que te diga? He said. In this instance, it was only a figure of speech, but I had an answer prepared for him. What do I want you to say, Juventino? You really want to know? Then here goes. I want you to tell me a story, and please, make it a horrible one. A tale of poverty and misery, of incest and abuse, starvation and terror, of family violence so hair-raising and horrifying that anyone who listens to it will have nightmares forever. If you can include mental retardation, we're off to the races. It has to be a tragic Aristotelian narrative that corresponds to the fundamental order of the universe. There has to be a chain of cause and effect that begins the day that Esperanza is born into wretchedness and has its inevitable climax at the moment she kills her baby, which leads inexorably to her arrest and for a denouement, the demonstration that she has been a saint in jail and is not only no longer a threat to society, but a penitent and productive individual. You following me, Juventino? Most importantly, make this story devastatingly sad. The grief, the gloom, the desolation have to be so overwhelming that they will break even the hardest-hearted, most vengeful Louisiana district attorney to tears. It has to be so heartbreaking that after hearing it, jurors would rather cut their own throats than send her to the gas chamber. Of course, I didn't actually say any of that. <laughs> I realized that Juventino had no story to tell, absolutely nothing to say about Esperanza or her family. Why should he? In half an hour, I tried to force him into what was probably more conversation than he'd had in the previous month. I asked him to reflect on things to which he'd never given a second's thought. Oops, that's me. Uh, <laughs> things that had nothing to do with his existence or survival. In Ojeras, Juventino plants and harvests corn and beans in season, and during the intervals between farm work, he tries to lay a little cement or hang drywall. That is, if he's not in California, Ohio, or North Carolina, hiding in the shadows while scrounging for any employment that will give him a little money to send home to his mother and sisters. I think that, that Cole was telling me I'd read enough. <laughs> I'll turn it off. So I, I wanted to, to begin, I, I think you're going to do another reading a bit later, yeah? Is that no, right? that's it. That's, that's it? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, uh, I wanted to ask... They already you bought the book, so... <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's a, there's a... It must have been pretty early on when you got that job that you were like, this is very literary, this line of work. Talk to me about the moment you, you sort of encountered the reality that you as a writer had not just a job that supported your writing in a monetary sense, but a job that had handed you an entire universe that would become a novel. Probably from the first day, Daniel, it was like, it was like I knew I was being invited into worlds, going to places, meeting people that I would never possibly be able to meet under any other circumstances. Uh, you know, I, I've lived in Mexico since 1990, or for most of the time since 1990. And uh, I live in Mexico City. I used to write a lot about Mexico City. I, I've, I've got a couple of books about it. I, I went into lots of strange corners of the city, but, and then I'd been to tourist areas and colonial cities and whatever, but now I was getting to go to little starving to death agricultural villages. Um, tiny towns, deserted cities where many, uh, much of the population had left because if they didn't leave and take the trouble of coming to the United States without documents, they would have starved to death. And then I would go to the cities where they were living on the outskirts, hiding in the shadows in the United States. And I thought, Th these are stories that not even my friends in Mexico know about. 
you know, I, I'm sure you know some Mexican writers. They, they're all like in their living rooms, like thinking metaphysically about, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, 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 Japan and <laughs> tennis matches and, and, and y y you know. Uh, that tennis uh, match novel was great. Yeah, that, uh, oh, no doubt. But, but I mean, most of the Mexican writers I know don't write about the reality of Mexico. That's all I was trying to say. No, 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 that's a fair point. Um, yeah, it's not, it's not the, it's, it's a Mexico that very few people who aren't from these towns would know. Um, and it's, and yet it's, it's also a Mexico that is very present here in the United States. I have been to towns in Texas and other states, Ar Arkansas, uh, Alabama, where if these undocumented immigrants were made to disappear overnight, which is of course the current fantasy of a lot of people, there would be no one left to cook a meal in a restaurant, uh, uh, make a bed in a hotel room, prune a tree, uh, 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 plant a garden, uh, 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 tend to a garden. I mean, the, the, the undocumented are an integral part of the economy of this of this country, and and there's a tremendous amount of hypocrisy p politically uh, uh, around their their existence. I mean, I don't know how this country would function without without them. Certainly, t t t tell me about the construction of Richard. You you began by saying that it wasn't you, and then you were like, oh, but this part totally happened, um, which is yeah. which is a uh, which is a game, uh, and uh, and a very seductive one, but I, I, I mean, I, I, I completely believe you that, that Richard is not you, that it's a construction. I also can see how, um, how your own experiences day to day in this work, w you know, every moment would feel filmic, literary, full of meaning, or maybe stultifyingly boring, and just, you know, talking to Juventino sounds like torturous as well. Um, but so, so talk to me about how you constructed the character of Richard as, as, as a voice separate from your own. Well, I really did get bit by a dog on one of my first cases, and I thought, like, if I ever write about this, I've got to include that. Um, if Richard has redeeming qualities, he, he's, he isn't the most sympathetic narrator, I think. I mean, he, he might have some redeeming qualities, and if he does, they're not me, I'm just the bad parts. No, I'm, I'm joking about that, but, um, you know, okay, so Richard's younger than me. Uh, he's got a lot more hair than I do. He, um, he, uh, he drinks way more than I do. He has more sex than I do. But, but the thing, and he, he also makes certain errors in judgment when he is doing his job that so far I have not made. Um, I'm not saying that I, I do my job perfectly, but, but I haven't made some of the mistakes that he makes. Um, All right, as a writer, uh, here's how my imagination works. And I'd really like to talk to you about your, the way it works with you, because this is, this is interesting to me. Like, I can't make up a story out of whole cloth. I don't have that kind of imagination. I need to either have lived an experience or read about something or have someone tell me about something. Then once that's happened, I can take off anywhere. Uh, uh, I can really go, go to lots of places with that, and and and, and go way, away, uh, on crazy detours from what my actual experience has been. But I can't sit there and make it up. I I wish I could. Life could be a lot easier. I think. Yeah, if. But I mean, I wondered about you know Lost City Radio and 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 um, um, your most recent novel, uh, uh, like some of it feels lived, and I know that it doesn't have to be lived to, to you know what I'm saying? I, I'm, I'm wondering if, if your process is similar, if you don't mind. Uh, I think it's your event. I, I, I think we should. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, no, I, I mean, I, I agree with a lot of what you said, and I, and I, and I, and I feel like I've, I've definitely like teased out from, from, uh, from, from real life, from, from, from my own experience. But I do want to talk about your book. Okay. Um, yeah. uh, the, the, it, it seems like the uh, this is a connection between Mexico and the United States yes. that we 
that we never talk about. Uh, yeah. Um, we talk about immigration. Uh, we talk about unaccompanied minors. We talk about, um, you know, the the heated political rhetoric. Yes. But we never talk about this, this this you know the legal system of two countries that is feels like after reading your book and feels like uh, like designed to punish the poorest of the poor, <laughs> like set up specifically for that almost. And Esperanza becomes a, a, a character who, who who lives that throughout and and. You made the choice as a writer to have Richard. Am I giving away too much by saying he falls in love with her? Oh no, I think you can say that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, well, I did. So, uh, <laughs> take it back. T t talk to me. Talk to me about that decision because it's, in in some ways, it. I think it's a it's a very well drawn, uh, just, you know, emotional step. Um. You know, I worked one case. It was with a Honduran client. It was the only woman client. Okay, most of the clients are men. The only, the only crime for which you can get the death penalty in the United States is murder. And I'm sorry if this sounds sexist, but men are just way better at committing murder than, than women. I mean, they do it a lot more often. And, um, y y you know, so most of the clients tend to be men. Now, I had this, I had a case with a woman, and it did feel different than having a male client. I mean, I, I felt for her in a way that I didn't um, with the, the, the male clients. Now, I, I did have professional distance, and, 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 and I, was, I didn't fall in love with her. Um, but the weird thing, Danielle, is that I got this case after I finished the novel. Um, I, 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 this novel was done finished in the can. I mean, I didn't go back and change a word because it was, it was already done. But it, it, it was interesting because it was sort of like, to a certain extent, reliving the novel after, after the fact. Oh, interesting, how interesting. But uh, also, I'm fascinated by Chekhovian love stories. You know, the, 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 these tragic love stories where two people who might be ideally suited for each other for one reason or another, can't get together. And I thought this is a perfect venue for, you, you know, having someone in jail who might well not only s either spend the rest of her life in jail or, or, or get the death penalty. That's a pretty difficult person to fall in love with. So I thought this was perfect, you know, for, for, for that aspect. Yeah. You know, I, I began by asking you about the, the the literariness of the job, but it, it occurs to me also that the the work of mitigation uh, mitigation specialist is yes. analyst specialist yes. that there that I don't know where you get a degree for that, but it seems like writing fiction is pretty good training in some ways. H have have you thought about that? How your literary work informs your absolutely your work as a mitigation specialist? Uh, uh, absolutely. Most people who do mitigation, Danielle, have backgrounds in law, social work, or psychology. But there are a few of us whose background is in journalism. Not so much writing fiction, but journalism. And a journalist is knocking on a stranger's door trying to get a compelling story. So we know how to do that. And the other thing about writers, y you know, the story, this is what you're doing in a death penalty case. You're t if you're on the defense, you are telling a story that you hope will be compelling enough that you'll convince either a prosecutor, a judge, or a jury not to kill someone, to save their life, that that life is worth saving. So uh, what the lawyers who work with us, the few writers, and one of them, uh, one of the writers, the one who got me into this, Debbie Nathan, sends her regards to you, uh, uh, she, uh, 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 the, the lawyers who work with us like us because we know how to tell the story. The social worker m might be better at other things than we are, but, but the writers are good at telling the story. That's what we do. And, and you know, w we write these memos that are very compelling and, and, and you know, th that's the good part of, of being a writer on this job. And, and, um, 
and the empathy. I mean, as a, as a novelist, you're trained to empathize with scoundrels, with, with everybody. And, and some of the places you're going, you're, as Juventino, as a scene you read, describes, it's not like people are necessarily forthcoming with the stories that you need. Sometimes you get witnesses that are just useless. It, 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 you know, some witnesses have loads and loads of really important, marvelous stuff that can that that you know definitely can can be the difference between life and death. But other clients have nothing to say, and you don't know until you get to the door and interview them. And and some of them are rightly skeptical of an outsider. Yes, uh, particularly in the most dangerous parts of Mexico. Uh, I mean, a stranger coming to your door is not, is usually not a good thing in those places. And, and, and uh, um, you know, I feel that when I get to the door, I've got a minute and a half to convince someone that I'm on their side and that I'm doing something good for someone in their family. And most of the time, you know, the thing that you say about empathy that I think is really interesting, so, do you become a writer and then acquire empathy? Probably it's the other way around, that you're an empathetic person, so you become a writer. And, and I think that's probably true, I would hope, of social workers and, and psychologists and some lawyers. I mean, the, the, the lawyers can be, can be pretty cold fish, but, but they're very good at, you know, their part of the job, which is, which is just all the maneuvering and filing the motions and, 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 and the, the, the legal ways to, to get the client saved. But... Um, but, you know, empathy, I think, is an important quality in a human being, period, not just a, a writer. I hope. I mean, you know, you hear the political discourse today, and it's like, oh, I guess empathy is not very high on the list of a lot of people. But, you know. Make America empathetic again. Right, doesn't exactly. Know. Doesn't know. Very good. I like that one. Too. You can run for something. Yeah. <laughs> writer in chief. Yeah. Um, does it work? In your experience, you've been doing this for now. Now I years. really have to touch wood. So far, not a single one of my clients has gotten the death penalty. Wow. I, I mean, there's a couple. There's a couple that that the cases have not been settled yet. But most of them are are you know either serving long sentences. A couple of them are back with their families. Uh, 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 and there's two or three that the appeals process continues. I mean, it's a it's a process that can go on for decades, literally. But um, not a single one has died yet. That's extraordinary. That's a, that's a track record. It's Hall of Fame numbers. Um, I've been lucky because I've worked with some very good lawyers, some very good other investigators, and also sometimes it's just the luck of the draw. The prosecutors have not been that hot about killing them. They're like, eh, we'll kill the next one, or, or <laughs> yeah. And, and th there's, a, there's an interesting uh, sort of literary technique in the book where uh, you have sections like sidebars, which feel like the, 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 the stuff that we're trained never to reach, like the comments section on, on the like, newspaper right, website, right. you know? Yeah. Um, and they're just like taken, I don't know, like with misspellings and all, and, and like, you know, but it's just vitriol, vitriol, vitriol. Yeah. And, and I want to ask you, as a novelist, why you chose to include that? It, it felt to me as a reader like you were contextualizing this this uh, uh, U.S. Mexico tension in a way. But I wanted to ask you, as a writer, why did you choose that technique? Uh, Danielle is referring to a chapter in the book in which I write a newspaper report about the crime that Esperanza has been accused of, and after the crime, um, I write the readers' comments that they've put online. Uh, one of the first things I do with every case is read the local newspaper, see how the crime has been reported in that community, and I read these, these readers' comments. And, okay, so I wrote that chapter. I wrote this book long before Trump announced his candidacy. Now I guess it's not a surprise how vitriolic, violent, and uh, uh, venomous many white Americans are toward Mexicans. Um, you know, there's a, someone in the audience here, Maurice Shama, who wrote an article about the, the, uh, the defense of Mexican nationals. For, uh, for it was on the Atlantic website. I would have thought the Atlantic would have a more sophisticated readership. But the reader's comments are almost as vitriolic and horrible as, as 
the reader's comments are in like the local paper in some little town in Texas or Alabama. Now, I was so horrified by these comments. Danielle, I am not kidding you. I barely changed a word. Those are actual reader's comments. I tweaked it a little because you know, I'm a writer. I can't help it. But most of it is almost word for word of comments that I have actually seen about. And I was so horrified by these comments that I felt I had to make a record of them. I had to, I had to put them in print. It, it's interesting because in any given, for any given case, the jury pool presumably are the comments section. And yet the stories that you're describing and the sort of the, 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 the speech in the mo and the, that Richard has, is his internal monologue b that when he's like, Juventino, what I want is this. I want you to break the heart of that racist you know, jury member uh, or the judge or the DA or whoever. Um, and and it, the novel succeeds on that level because the story uh, of Esperanza is all of that. H how, how, how much of a composite is it? How... how, how not how true is it, not is Esperanza's story based on, on one particular case, but how much of that, uh, the, the scale of her suffering is, is authentic to the stuff you've seen, and then how much of it uh, shocked even you, who'd been living in Mexico for, you know, for 20 years when you started this work? Okay, so most of my friends in Mexico City are these like middle class people. You know, they're, they're, they, they have not led lives like this. But once I started to do this work, I am going and seeing the most desperately impoverished, and when I say impoverished, I'm not just talking about economically, I'm talking about culturally, uh, uh, in terms of affection, in terms of, in terms of uh, 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 any kind of resources, not just economic, but emotional, um, um, practical, people who really struggle through life. And um, a lot of the terrible things that I report about in the book are, I mean, I changed things around, but I didn't, I don't feel like I made it up. I, I, I mean, these are things, this is the way that many undocumented Mexicans actually live in the United States. And that, the, the descriptions of Esperanza's life in Mexico <coughs> I think are typical of Mexicans who leave Mexico and come here without documents, just trying to improve their lot a little bit. What What is your relationship with uh, with the, the Mexican literary scene? Being that you know, the, the, it's like five colonias in in the DF, and um, and it is a it is a very uh, you know. It can seem like a, like a very a, 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 a the literary pursuits are very distant from the reality that you're describing, with the exception of perhaps narco literature, which is a, a different strand. But you know, do they look at you like the bicho raro of like w like este gringo? What is he doing? You like know, uh, 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 because you're bringing I back reports from from the moon for them. Yeah, because I do the work I do. I mean, I'm traveling a lot. I'll, uh, I do have friends among Mexican writers, and um, uh, uh, uh I love them, but I, I, I don't see them that much because I'm traveling a lot. And I also, I make it a point to have friends who are not writers. You know, I think, I think it's important for writers to know people who aren't writers. Uh, and um, I have to say that, like, a lot of the fiction that's coming out of Mexico is, you know, extremely metaphysical. And um, um, we all have our blind spots as readers, like, in Latin American literature, in the boom writers, I would rather read a novel by Garcia Marquez or, or Vargas Llosa than Cortázar or, or, or Borges. I, I'm just less m m metaphysical and more realistic. Uh, uh, and, you know, that's just, that's just me. So I, I can't claim that I read a lot of contemporary Mexican literature. I'd like to read more, but look, here's something. I have to say this in my defense. I have just spent the last 16 months reading In Search of Lost Time twice. I read the whole thing 
once and I felt, you know what, I gotta begin at the beginning and read it again. So that's the kind of reader I am. I'm, I don't read a lot of contemporary books, except for yours, Nanya. Uh, 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 I, I, I'm Me just, and Bruce, thank you. I, I'm just not that, you know. And I, I realize that that probably limits my understanding of what's going on with 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 the novel today. But but I would rather read a, a classic than than. It, it, it did remind me a bit of Yuri Herrera's work. I don't know if you read Yuri Herrera. Oh yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, you know, I actually, I, I really writer. like him. He's I really like. I, I thought, I, 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 his first book made a big impact on me. Yeah, yeah. But the the, the second book, uh, the uh, Makina, what's her name? What's the book's name? Fuck. I don't Be remember. Beautiful book. I, I have um, it, but I haven't read it yet. I, I just read the first one. Oh well, then you weren't influenced by it, I guess, since you didn't no. read it. I was going to ask you about oh. that book because yeah. it it does it talks about. Uh, a young woman named Makina who you know goes to El Norte to look for her brother, oh, and, okay. and kind of passes through this this you know blighted landscape. She's not from it, but she passes right. through it, and uh, and and there's a there's a a, a a visceral sort of sense that violence is just right around the corner at any given moment as they're passing through this this hard land. You know, it's yeah. it's, it's rule for territory. It's I, hard, I it's have it at place. home. I'm going to read it. I, 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 mean, I, I recommend I, it. The, the After thing you is read uh, Proust for the third time. Well, no, no. I, I, I <laughs> Twice, I think with twice I've done it. But I, I just felt when I... I had a brother who died of AIDS at 35. And he somehow, at 35 years old, had managed to read Proust twice. So going to Proust was like a way of communing with my brother. But it's also like an incredible, I don't know if you've read it, it's, it's an incredible book. I, I understand, I have a friend in Brazil whose father never read any other book. He read In Search of a Lost Time like 18 times and, and that's all he ever read. But, and I could understand that, but, but you know, once I got started I felt like this is a project I have to do. And now I can read like a lot of, you know, because you know, most of the contemporary Mexican novels, they're short. You can read them in a day or two days. So it, it'll feel like a picnic after Proust, you know. Uh, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Come with a reading list right. afterwards, yeah. Please. Yeah. I, I want to make sure we have time for questions from the audience. Uh, so maybe we can turn to... And I have a microphone that I can run to anyone who has a question. How many cases have you handled? How many cases have you handled? Uh, I have worked either part or the entire mitigation on about 20 cases. Um, some of them I've just had a little piece of. Like when they first hired me, they would have me do the Mexican side and somebody else would do the US side. M I, I'd rather do both sides because you know I you can be assured of the consistency of the work. But some, some cases I haven't done the whole thing. Most of them I have. Hi, David. Hello. I am curious, um, a follow-up to Danielle's question about how you are perceived in Mexico as a writer. And I know your work is known, I mean, definitely your first book that I ever read about Mexico City was known to people I met there. Um, but you've had so many other things that you've written since then, and I, I really am curious. I think you sort of didn't um, answer his question. Sorry, sorry. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, I'm sorry. Know. I didn't. Thank you, Thank you Jessica. Yeah. I do appreciate that. You're right. I didn't answer your question. So, um, sadly, this book, One Life, is the only book of mine that I wrote in English that was translated into Spanish. Um, every other book I've written, I wrote one book in Spanish. It's a, it's a collection of magazine articles that I wrote about Mexico City for different magazines and newspapers there. And that got published in Spanish, but they've never translated my other books. So I, I think I am known. I don't really know, though, what... Y you know, the, here's a weird thing, Jessica. Uh, in Mexico, if you're a writer, like, they'll put you on TV sometimes. I, I've been asked to be on TV and talking about food and talking... I, there was this show where they had writers come on and cook something. So I use my grandmother's recipe for chopped liver. Uh, 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 and there's this very, one of the hosts was this very skinny girl who made this very bad face at the idea of eating liver. But once she tasted it, she liked it. Um, um, uh, 
But I don't really know, like, all right, one, I can tell you, w one night in a cantina, this Mexican writer, after he'd had more than a few drinks, turned to me and said, why don't you write about New York? <laughs> and I was like, all right, okay, I get it. And I wondered, like, is that what they're saying about me behind my back? Like, why didn't this guy go back to New York and write about New York? I don't really know what, I, I mean, some of the writers I know they really like me because we're good friends and, and, and we hang out. And um, I think some of them, uh, I hope they like the work, I, but I really don't know. Like, well, it, it's, has it been, it's, it's coming out in Mexico City? Actually, this book, got published simultaneously with a beautiful Spanish translation by a woman named Fernanda Melchor. I really heard my voice in the translation. I'm very excited about it. And I think this book will have resonance maybe more there than here. I mean, I, I could tell you what readers say more than, I mean, the readers who read my books really like, I'm so touched, like, this guy came up to me. I, I did a thing in Zacatecas, which is a northern state. They, they, they had a thing called Zacatecas, Tierra de Lectores, and they invite writers there. And um, this guy came up to me and he said, nos entiendes, you understand us. And I, I, I was so touched. And I have heard things like that from, first of all, as any writer here knows, the hard part is just to get anyone to read your books. But once they read my books, they tend to like them. David, I, I read your first two books, and I wanted to say, first of all, I really loved them. But both of them had a real, to me, rather horrifying kick at the end of them. And I wondered, when I only read 12 pages of this while I was waiting, and I wondered if this is going to not end up, hopefully, that he saves the woman. And uh, you, you know... Uh, Susan, the woman who just made that remark, knows that my mother was a Holocaust survivor, and I also had a brother who died of AIDS. So I think this has affected my worldview. I <laughs> don't think that the world is a just place. Um, I don't think I will ever write a rosy book. But one of the reviews, one of the early reviews, said something about that they considered the book hopeful. And I, I know I'm writing about a pretty a, a milieu in which it's pretty hard to find hope. But somebody saw it there, and that made me feel very good, Susan. Thank you guys for being here. That yeah. was wonderful. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Congratulations.